Once again, taking your Bibles and turning to Romans chapter 3. Let's look at verse 22 and 23. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Of course, the title of the message is Total Depravity, and we're on part three, the last part of Total Depravity. And uh, <clears throat> we will move on with the next one, um, Unconditional Election, next week and for however long that takes us. And we left off last week with the damage... Resultant since man is totally depraved, he is totally deprived of all ability to please God. So that's kind of where we left off. And we talked about that a dead, dead person can't do anything. And that's what we are spiritually when we came from the womb. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Secondly, the sinner is defiled. Thirdly, is what we'll finish up with this morning. The sinner is disabled. The sinner is disabled underneath that heading that we just gave you as the third part. There's one more point after that that we'll be covering this morning, but the sinner is disabled. What we mean by that is he cannot save himself. And we've pretty much proved that over the last uh, couple messages that we've given on total depravity. And will not turn to Christ for salvation until he is born again by the Spirit of God. Turn to John chapter 1 and verse 13. And we're going to be, it was ironic what Brother Chuck had this morning. Because uh, you're kind of going to get a double dose here of this, of what he was referring to. We uh, kind of anticipated some of what he was going to cover, but not all, because the, this afternoon's message is going to be hitting pretty close to what he had to say, because it's going to be coming from 1 John chapter 4. So as you turn there to John chapter 1 and verse 13, we've been over this, but let us go again to the word of God. We see here in John 1, 13, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Then turn over to John 6, 36, chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And then he goes on to say, Christ speaking here, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. So that's how it's done. There shouldn't be any argument there concerning that. So what about man's free will that we hear much about today? Can he not will to come to Christ? Well, John 540 says, as Christ answered, ye will not come to me that ye may have life or that ye might have life. So Christ himself is telling us that we're not going to come on our own free will. We cannot. Because we don't have the spirit to do so. The spirit that dwells inside every true believer is what gives him the ability to call on Christ. Until that time, it's not going to happen. Again, I refer you back to Paul's road trip to Damascus. That's how we're saved. Paul wasn't there to, to find Christ. He had no intentions of finding Christ. What he did have intentions to do is kill all who believed in Christ. 
Persecute the church. Destroy all Christians. That's what his means was. And Christ stopped him and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting the church? Why are you doing all this? And at that moment, that second, Saul was saved. And we know him today as Paul, of course. But he was saved. First things out of his mouth is the Lord. <laughs> and then, Lord, what will you have me to do? He was ready, prepared. Whatever God wanted him to do, whatever the Lord had for him to do, he was going to go. He was willing to go. And I know through my own ordination that that's what I ended up having to be when God called me to the ministry. That's where I had to come to. I had to humble myself before God and say, okay, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do. We cannot resist when God calls. So man's will is motivated and controlled by his nature. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, which I know everybody in here probably should, should know this if they, they don't already. But Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, and here's the, the ironic thing of this. Many people won't believe this. And that's okay if that's what they want to believe. I can't make them believe it. But if you don't believe this, then you're going contrary to the word of God. You can't go contrary to the word of God. This is the word of God. This is how we live and practice our Christian life. Every jot, every tittle, every word that's in there is how we're supposed to live our life. You know, we hear today, oh, that was back then. That was back in, in the early church. That's when, you know, Paul and John and all of them were speaking to the church there. Well, what do you think we are? See, we're the representatives of those same churches. We are the offsprings. We just don't stop teaching and preaching the doctrines that Christ taught because, oh, this is today. This is 2022. Things have changed. Things are different. We don't go back to the Old Testament because that wasn't for us. That was for them. But this whole book is written from the Old Testament. Everything that's written here, Paul, John, Peter, James, all came from the Old Testament. It is our example. And it's how we're supposed to live our lives. You don't change because of the time. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday today as, as he is tomorrow. There's no change in him. But Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, which we're going to talk about this afternoon, the love of God, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You can't deny that. I mean, you can if you want to. But then it's on your head. Then it's between you and God at that point. I've been called to tell you the truth, to preach the truth. Brother Chuck, Brother Ray have been called to tell you and preach you the truth. We can't deviate from that. We can't deviate because you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, I, well, I don't understand. What is it that you don't believe? It's the word of God. How can you not believe the word of God? It's like the bumper sticker. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, God said it, that settles it. I don't care whether you believe it or not. It don't make no difference what you believe. It's what God says. And somebody will go, well, that's your private interpretation. No, it's not. It's the word of God. That's what it says. It's very simple. God made it very simple for the, his children. He is free. You want to use free will. He is free to turn to Christ, but not able. You want to turn to Christ? Go ahead. But you do not have the tools whereby you can do that. You're not able. 
I am free to make a million dollars. But so far, it seems that I'm not able. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Turning to Christ is a spiritual act, and the sinner is spiritually dead. Romans 3.11, there is none that seeketh after God. I mean, we just, were we supposed to take that and just say, oh, that's just something Paul came up with? What are we to do with that? There is none that seeketh after God. And then in Revelation twenty two seventeen, whosoever will may come. That's right. Whosoever will. Well, who are the whosoever's? The one that God chose before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. And we'll prove that. Do we? <clears throat> but see, the problem is none will. Except the Father draw them. John 6, 44. Ye would not. Christ says in Matthew 23, 37. Do we not read? Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. We do read that. You can turn to Joshua 24 and 15. Let's read the whole thing. We need to read the whole thing there because we got to understand what Joshua was saying. Some people say, well, they made a choice. Did they? What choice did they make? That's what we have to understand here. Once again, Joshua 24 and verse 15. Here's what Joshua said, and we'll explain this. And if it seem evil unto you to serve God. Okay, got that point? If it is evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were, were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what was Joshua saying there? We want to notice First, that it is addressed to those whom it seemed evil or worthless to serve the Lord. Isn't that what he said? If it's evil to you to serve the Lord, then make a choice between this God and this God. Because they thought it was evil. We're not serving the Lord because it's evil. That's what they were saying. So... Notice that this is the first address. Will you continue to apply this to yourself? Then secondly, the choice is not between choosing the Lord and the devil or the world or something else. The choice is now between the gods of the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. That's what the choice was. It wasn't whether they choose the Lord or not. It's that he thought it was evil to, to, to believe in him and choose him. It was evil to them. So Joshua's giving them the way out. If you think that's evil to serve the Lord, then you have a choice. What God are you going to serve? So it seems evil to serve the Lord. Now choose which God you will serve. You had better hear Christ in doing so in John 15. If you turn there, John 15, verse 16. For some reason, they want to throw this part of the Bible out. They want to eliminate this verse. Henceforth. Or, excuse me, verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. What did Christ say? You didn't choose me. I chose you. 
You won't choose me. You won't come unto me that you may have eternal life. Why? Because you are not able. You're not able to do it. Then you go back to John chapter 3. You don't have to go there now, but you can go back to John chapter 3. What happened there? Nicodemus came to talk to Jesus. And Jesus kind of rebuked him and said, you're a teacher and you don't know these things? You've got to be born again. And don't worry about that part, but the Spirit's got to do the work. You can't do it on your own. So it may be protested that man is not responsible for his sin. This is an age-old argument. Well, we're not responsible. What Adam did, Adam did. We're not responsible. So let us try such reasoning with the laws of our land. So let's, let's look at a few of them. Why should a man be sentenced to prison for drunkenness when he is addicted, an addicted drinker and he cannot help it? You know what alcoholism is? The world wants you to know that it's a disease. It's sin. Plain and simple, it's sin. Here is another man who cannot stop stealing. Is he accountable? Is he responsible? Here is another who has such a temper, he has murdered several people, but he cannot help it. Are these men no longer responsible to obey the civil laws because of their inability? No, in no wise. They're not let off because they're not responsible. Shall we ask God to do that which our own sense of justice refuses? I'm not going to do it. But God, you need to take me to heaven. <laughs> right? Isn't that what they're asking? Oh, God, no, God wouldn't do that. He's going to take me to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I may be a rotten person, but I'm going to heaven. You're guilty. You're guilty of sin. And the most important part, you're guilty for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. These, these folks are condemned. Now, Brother Chuck made a point that we would hope before the rapture happens that these folks that we, he was referring to this morning would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He didn't come out and say it right like that, but that's what we're, we're hoping, right? And it's hard. I'll agree. To me, it's hard. You know what I want? I got to take them out right now. Take them out. Get rid of them. But then I got to stop myself and say, okay, God has a purpose. I have to go along with whatever purpose he has. I just happen to be living in a time period when I have to make these adjustments. And have to make a stand for what's right and what's wrong. So to despise the laws of the land does not excuse us from the responsibility to obey them. Inability does not do away with responsibility. Just because you're not able doesn't mean you're not responsible. If you go out here and you're in a drunken stupor, you get in the car and you take off down the road and there's a, there's a six-year-old girl standing on there on the sidewalk and you run her over and kill her. Are you responsible? Well, absolutely you're responsible. But I was intoxicated. I don't care. You're responsible. I am responsible to pay my debts. Whether I'm able or not, right? I mean, I wish that we could just say, ah. <laughs> forget my debts. That's not it. We're responsible. So the sinner is responsible to keep the moral law of God, though he is unable. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1.
1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane and murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and for manslayers, for whoremongers, <coughs> for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for prejudiced persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. What I just read there, you know what our forefathers did? Huh? You know what they did? They set up a form of government for the people, by the people. You know what has happened? The government just took over. It's for the government, by the government. You know what the forefathers put in there? Nobody pays any attention to anymore. I don't understand that part. That once a form of government rises up that is no longer for the people, by the people, that, that form of government is supposed to be disbanded and those that are able are to disband them and set up a form of government for the people, by the people. Now, I may not quoted that just right, but that's what it says. We have every right to stand up against the government because they're breaking the law. They all should be tried and found guilty for tyranny. You know what they would have done under our forefathers? They all have been hanged. I don't want to send them over on a fast boat to China. I want to see the justice being done to them for what they have done. But they will. Believe me, they will. I think Brother Chuck read it this morning. For every knee shall bow. And every knee shall confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Before they're thrown in the lake of fire. The Christian is responsible to live without sin. Aren't we trying to do that? Aren't we trying to obey the laws and do the right things? And what's, what's our reward? Persecution. For doing what's right, we're being persecuted. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and 1. And I know you've been here. His brother Chuck's been here for quite a while on... <coughs> Wednesday night when he was doing this. Chapter, <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we can go to, go to him and ask forgiveness. And he will forgive us. Don't ever be too proud to ask for forgiveness. Look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and verse 25, or verse 15, excuse me. Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. For that which I do, now listen to Paul here. You know, I've, I've argued this with people. They don't believe this. I've argued this with Baptist preachers that think that they're sinless. They won't believe this first. This, this, this part of the scriptures, they refuse to believe this. But it's a fact Paul's telling us of him in own self what's going on in his life. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Isn't that what we do? The things we hate the most, we end up doing them. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. 
Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Take time to go in there and cipher this, decipher this. You, you come out of there with a clear meaning of your depravity. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, the spiritual led man, the Holy Spirit that's there in the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, the flesh still has old sin nature. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. No one's guiltless. You can point the finger all day long. No one's guiltless. We're all able. And again, it's great to know that God forgives. David S. Clark, Salabus of Systematic Theology, said this The plea, I am not able, therefore not responsible, depends on how the inability arose. If it is a created inability, the fault lies with the Creator. Then there can be no obligation on man's part. But if acquired, the obligation remains. It's acquired. We're born with the sin nature. Now take the time. I don't want to take the time because I'm running out of time. Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21 it was acquired from Father Adam and is embraced by all his race. Well, yeah, let me go ahead and read that. Chapter 5 of Romans, verse 12. We get more out of it if I just go ahead and go there. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sin, so is the gift for the judgment, was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Just as Brother Ray mentioned either last week or the week before, justified never sinned. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, 
But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So then the other argument is, well, shall we sin that grace may abound? No. Just don't go out here and do it just because grace is going to abound. The last point, the deliverance. The deliverance. God chose a certain number through innumerable Though innumerable to man, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. I just had a form question that asked this very question. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can read it when it comes out. But this is the very verse that they wanted to know about. To the right place here. Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. It's innumerable. You can't count them all. That's how God works. We have no idea who they are, but it, there is an innumerable number to be saved and choose. And excuse me. And the choice is an eternal one made before the foundation of the world. This was made before the foundation of the world. God made the choice. The Son of God came and took their sins upon himself and died for their sins and for them. All that the Father giveth me in no wise, in no wise will I cast out. He won't cast them out. He died for those that God gave him. He also makes a statement, those that are condemned, they're condemned already. He can't come to it because God didn't allow it to happen. Not that he chose them into hell. He just left them alone. He didn't do anything with them. But he chose out of the world his people. And I'll show that here in a minute. So in God's time, the Holy Spirit comes and gives the new birth. And eternal life to these dead sinners by the sovereign will of Christ. God working in them both to will and to do of his good pleasure Philippians 2.13. Thus Christ comes to live in their hearts and they are born of God. Not by their own will, but by the will of God. You can find that in, first, in John chapter 1. I'm not going to go there, but you will see this choice. That God made this afternoon. When I bring the message on the love of God. We'll see what God did. Why? Because of his love. And we'll express that and explain that. Lastly, the assurance that this has happened to you. Is that you once found yourself sincerely troubled and burdened. With your sins and your lost condition, thus seeing your great need of Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you then were graciously led to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for eternal salvation. And now you know that you have passed from death unto life. John 5, 24. Again, 1 John 5, 1, which Brother Chuck will be going to hopefully next week, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So there's total depravity. And I'll tell you this, if you can't, as a Christian, see your depravity, then you need to examine yourself. You need to examine yourself. If you look in the mirror and say, well, I'm an all right guy, everything's fine, then you're deceiving your own selves. 
See, what, what Satan is doing right now, and Brother Chuck brought it out, he's trying to make us fearful. Let's consider the whole thing here. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. End the story. That's who we're supposed to fear. You know, I've given you plenty of examples, but you may say that you fear me. Well, that's wrong. It's not me you have to worry about. Myself, Brother Chuck, Brother Ray, we're mouthpieces for God. God has instilled in us to give you the message. And you, you want to see the whole picture go into Jeremiah and see what God did to Jeremiah. And Isaiah. And some of the other prophets. They weren't willing. <laughs> Moses wasn't willing. I wasn't willing. But it's a huge responsibility. And I'm only out to please one person. And I make mistakes. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. You know, when people look at preachers, they think, oh, you know, he's perfect. He's not nah, nah. wrong thinking, wrong guy. We're not. We're fallible. We make mistakes. And I've always been the very first one when I make a mistake to come back and say I made a mistake. See, here's the thing with me, and I, I imagine Brother Chuck and Brother Ray. When we do something contrary to God's word, you know what happens? God gets on us, and he burdens us so bad. You know, I walk around the house, I'm moping around, my wife says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, there's this burden, see, it's on my back. And the only way I can get it off is to get it taken care of. A lot of times for me is, is writing. If I write it down, there's such a relief. Because then I can see it, God's speaking to me about it, and I can get it down. And then I, a lot of times I'm fine. My biggest problem is I read my form questions ahead. And I shouldn't because once I do, then it's in there and I can't get rid of it until I get it wrote down. We're, you know, I, I've talked to, to Lonnie, you know, he's a visitor, but I've talked to Lonnie about this. You know, we may say we were born way too late in life, way too late. For me, even though it was kind of a difficult time for our country to be born back in the early or the late 1700s. Or then during, you know, during the, the wars we've had, the Revolutionary War, and during the Civil War, which he portrays, or used to portray, they were different times. But it seems like we have a passion and, and a compassion for that time. But we can't say that because what we can say is, God has put us here for now. We're here for now. He has a purpose. We have to find the purpose and we have to fulfill that purpose for God. May God bless his word to your heart today. Brother Gordon.